it, it, it's there for, for you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so good uh, to be here. And let me start with a little uh, family indulgence. Um, it was last year at the time of the CCDA conference in Dallas that my brother and 35-year partner in ministry on the west side of Chicago um, collapsed and lay comatose in a hospital. And so I didn't make it to uh, the CCDA conference. But uh, he was the one who, when our church uh, 23 years ago decided that if we didn't do something about housing, there wouldn't be a neighborhood left to be the church of, and when the church decided to mortgage itself as the only collateral that we could find for loans to begin this housing ministry, he was the one who gave it the leadership. And he was the one who, when we came to the tough decisions and the risky moments, said, by the grace of God, let's do it. And his favorite saying from the pulpit was, you ain't seen nothing yet that God is always making a way and opening the doors and making it happen. And as we stood all those eight days in the hospital as he lay comatose, as we stood at his hospital bed, the streams of people came by. And I'll never forget one of those moments when we held hands, a group of people around his hospital bed. And it was a bishop who was a bishop of our church who said, he taught me how to be a pastor. And it was a young woman who had tried to take her own life and who my brother had nurtured with the understanding that God loves you and you're very special in God's sight, who was now uh, trying to be a nurse. And it was a drug addict who had, was in the throes of recovery and who said, if he, he walked with me even when I re relapsed and when I fell back, he was always there for me helping to open a door. And it was a young man who said, when I look at around at all the other people, my peer group on the streets, and he's a, a salesman for uh, IBM, and he said, had it not been for the church and had it not been for Pastor Nelson, I would be dead or in jail. And there were the people who came around that bedside and who prayed together for a life well lived. And so I want to remember that that's the what, real things in life, what we do with other people and how we stand with them in these moments. And then I, I think about, when I think of this question, what are we going to do about it, I think about my mother. I had a very audacious mother who was a pastor's wife and stood up for her right to be uh, a homemaker uh, in a time when women were beginning to go out into the workforce and raising uh, and uh, making incomes. And when the question came in Washington, D.C., she had a Bible class out at Occoquan, the women's penitentiary, uh, every week and went out. And when she began to realize that the women were released on Saturday afternoons with $20 in their pocket, and there were no halfway houses 45 years ago in the Washington area, our home became the halfway house. And while she then went... Uh, to pester Congress, the halls of Congress, to get the monies to establish halfway houses. What are you going to do about it? My mother walked down that road and took the next steps and led the way. What are you going to do about it? It was my mother who, uh, so concerned about the first strike weapons and the nuclear arsenals that were building up, uh, who wrote to her congressman, who stood at rallies and spoke up uh, against these uh, first strike weapons, because she said she loved her country and she wanted her country to be doing what was right. And it was my mother who, in exasperation that none of these things had made a difference, at the age of 78, with a heart condition and cancer, she put her body in a little boat in front of a trident nuclear submarine in those cold Puget Sound waters. And a trident submarine is five football fields long and has enough atomic uh, nuclear warfare on it to destroy the world seven times over. And my mother put herself in that little boat and uh, in front of the Trident nuclear submarine, and she was arrested. Can you imagine? I was proud of my mother seeing her in handcuffs and coming before that judge.
And late that evening, after the, tri after the uh, bond hearing, and they released them on personal recognizance, the newspaper reporters, because my mother had been named American Mother of the Year by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Can you imagine the, <laughs> such a paradox? That the newspaper reporters all came with microphones up to my mother, and they said, why did you, an American Mother of the Year, commit civil disobedience? And without a moment's hesitation, she said, I did it for the children of the world. Amen. And that's the kind of heritage that kind of keeps you pushing on when you think about these things. Well, this economic scene in America today is one of these great disparities between the rich and the poor. The retired CEO, Jack Welsh of GE Corporation, gets a pension of $357,128 a month. Compare that to the $357 many of our seniors get from Social Security in our apartment house in, on the west side of Chicago. Great disparities between the rich and the poor. A time when public education, the greatest tool for helping people enter the workforce and enter the economic life of this country, is one of great savage inequalities. When some schools spend four and five times as much on each child as they do in our neighborhood on the west side of Chicago. What do we expect when we don't invest those dollars in public education? Prisons. When prison has become the fastest growing economic um, enterprise in this nation. For-profit companies have taken over prisons. And so the thing has changed from a, a notion of rehabilitation to one, if you're going to make a profit on a prison, you want to keep them full. And you want to keep everybody tranquilized so they don't disturb the peace. So it's in the interests of the corporations who own, who operate our prisons these days to keep them full. And you know how, how different the justice system is if you're of color and if you're poor and how that justice system is so unjust. What a time we live in. And if you ever want to read a book that just opens your eyes on this whole prison uh, industry, it's called Going Up the River by John Hallinan. And it's really an eye-opener how some of our towns are so dependent now on this prison industry. That's their livelihood. And that's the destruction of our young people and of the men of our communities. And then these drums of war that we prayed about this morning that not only are weapons of destruction and our devastation of the world, but are taking the very dollars that we need to be spending on health care and on public education and on all of these things. You know that poster that uh, I've got on the wall in my office that says, oh, that'll be the day when the Pentagon has to hold a bake sale and the schools get all the money they need. And I have another cartoon that I have on my wall in the office that says, boy, they were always talking about national security. And this guy is all huddled in himself and he says, but I've never felt so insecure in all my life. The, the nation, the drums of war that are in our country today. So what are we going to do about it? As we think in our neighborhoods and where we live and where we work and what's happening there, uh, sometimes we can get overwhelmed with these problems. And that happens so often in our neighborhoods when we, when we go to talk about, well, what are we going to do about it? The first thing people do is say, well, we're just, we got drugs and we got crime and we, our schools don't work and our streets aren't safe. Uh, and we're overwhelmed by the problems. And yet we, we need to take the asset-based community development approach that's, that looks and says, what are the opportunities? What are the capacities? What do we have here in our midst as we think about it? And as we think about economic development, we think about employment and job creation and affordable housing and commercial and industrial development and asset building kinds of efforts. And let me give a caution here when we talk about economic development. Those of us in faith-based organizations don't have a very good record for successfully operating business enterprises. 
And we could do a whole workshop on what we've learned through our failures. And uh, Bethel could be probably the first to help uh, lead that workshop. But we need to have a caution when we think about this. But you know, when we think about economic development, uh, John Perkins is always talking about not only do you give a man a fish, uh, give one a fish and they'll eat for the day, and you teach them to fish uh, and they'll eat for a lifetime, but you've got to help them own the pond. So we need to think beyond the sort of first-line kinds of thinking. And as our churches think about economic development, I know when Bethel started, Bethel, Bethel Church started Bethel Moon Knife, and we went to the other churches in our neighborhood, and we said, and this is 23 years ago, we said, why don't you join us and let's start with doing some affordable housing. And everybody said, well, we don't know how, we don't have any money, and it takes too long. And isn't that the way it is for many of our communities and many of our boards who say, we don't know how, we don't have the money, and it takes too long. Well, that's just as Hypen was talking about Mark 6 and the feeding of the 5,000. That's just what the disciples told Jesus when he said, feed them. They said, well, we don't have any money. Where are we going to get it? And they had the very same excuses that all of us run across as we're doing it. But I want to share then a couple of thoughts um, regarding how we as Christian community developers are going to do some economic development. And I take the story from Elisha, uh, the Second Kings 4, 1 through 7, when the widow, a very poor widow, came to Elisha. Uh, 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. She came to Elisha because she was so poor and she had so many debts, her husband had died and left her in debt. She had so many debts that her creditors had come to her and said, uh, you need to sell your children so that you can pay your debts. And she was desperate, but she didn't give up. So she went to Elisha, the prophet. And so Elisha had to be accessible. He had to be where she was or the, where she could get to to even go to him. And you know what Elisha said? He said, what do you have in your house? What do you have in your house? And she was a poor lady, and they were about to have to sell off her children. And she said, I just have one little jar of oil. I have one little jar of oil. I have five loaves and two fishes. I, have, I don't have any money. And that's, so Elisha asked the first most important, look at what we've got. And you know that poem, that uh, Chinese poem that John Zhao was pushing on us, uh, build on what they have. Uh, start with what they know. And so Elisha did that. And as she, then he said, uh, go and find some more jars. And she went to her neighbors. And so, you know, it's that notion of community, right? Of us going to our neighbors, of having them, and not being afraid, won't you come and join in this economic enterprise? Won't you come? And they loaned her the empty jars. And so, um, and then she, God said, shut, uh, Elisa said, shut the door and start pouring. Well, can you imagine this widow had one little jar of oil? And Elisha told her something big. Start pouring. And she had just hundreds of jars there, empty jars. But, you know, God has pushing us to just start pouring. To shut the door and get rid of all those negative feelings that are out there. And all our board members are saying, we don't have any money and we don't know how to do it. And God is saying, start pouring. Just start doing it. And she did start pouring, and she poured and she poured till she had filled up every one of the jars. Now, you remember, Elisha did not do anything for her except ask the questions and say, just do it. Just like last night the pastor was talking about, just do it. And when she poured and she had no more jars to fill, then Elijah said one, Elisha said one more thing. Go and sell the oil and pay your debts and live on the rest. So God makes a way out of no way. When we start pouring, when we look at what we have and we take that and we begin and we make it happen. So as we think about economic development, 
the first thing I want to say is that we need to be clear as Christian community development why we do it. If we're going to just replicate what the marketplace is going to do anyway, we don't, we don't need to be doing that. Right. We need to be doing what the marketplace won't do. You know, in real estate, they say location, location, location. Well, we need to take the toughest locations, our neighborhoods, where the marketplace says, uh-uh, we can't make it work there. We need to be doing those things, and we need to be doing them differently than the marketplace does them. So we've got to be clear about what our values are, why we're doing it. We're not just starting, we don't want a, a drugstore in our community just to have a nice drugstore where all the profits go out into somebody else's hands and the jobs are somebody else's jobs. If we're going to do Christian community development in our communities, we've got to make sure there's career ladders and there's jobs for people out of it, that the profits from these things stay in the community, that people are empowered in this process, that there's a community good that comes out of it. We don't need to sell our souls to become the waste dumps for nuclear disposal or, any, or the garbage of other people's communities. We need to make sure that something good for our neighborhoods, for our people, uh, is going to come out of it. And we need to be clear about why we're doing what we're doing before we can even think about the how. And you know, many of us need to be thinking today, it's not just moving people off of welfare, but it is really figuring out how do we walk with and help people move out of poverty. That's the real question that we need to be about. And there are some new tools out there to think about that. Individual development accounts and financial education. And, and the Christian Reform Press has put out a wonderful book called Faith and Finances, which links this whole financial education with the notion of stewardship, with all that I have comes from God, so that I don't just want to learn to manage my money so I can get more and more and more, but I want to give back and I want to do it wisely and think about my children's future and what's going to make a difference. So the, we need to keep focused on the right issues. And if we're going to the why we're going to do it, if we want the things to work, we've got to be willing to risk. Our church mortgaged itself five times as collateral on housing loans that the bank wouldn't give us unless we had some collateral. And that was our five loaves and two fishes. We owned our church building free and clear. So we mortgaged it. We risked that thing we loved in order to make it happen. The second thing we have to do is we have to be clear about the why, and the second thing is that we've got to be smart about what we do. We can't just sort of pray and say, okay, God, do it, and not do our homework. We've got to be smart about what we do. You remember Esther in the book of Esther? When she wanted a certain thing out of the, out of the king, she was smart, okay? She dressed up in her best clothes, and she put on perfume, and she enticed, and she lured that king, and she said, come on, honey, you know? <laughs> and she did, when the king said, well, you can have anything you want, you know, she didn't right away even tell the king what she wanted. You know what the next thing she did? She f set a feast, a banquet, and she fed him well, and she got him drunk. And then, then she told the king what she wanted. Now, I don't say we should use that strategy. But we've got to be smart. We've got to be smart about what we do. And we've got to figure out. And we're, you know, young people today, you're so lucky that that you can learn from all of our mistakes. There are master's programs in community economic development now, and there are courses and workshops in community economic development, and, and um, there are a lot more books that are out. Um, the Asset-Based Community Development uh, Network has a whole variety of books. This one's called Community Transformations, Turning Threats into Opportunities. There, is so, there are so many more resources and then there are some of us old timers who could share with you all the mistakes that we made and so you don't have to make them yourselves. 
We've got to be smart about what we do. We need to be strategic and creative in financing, whether it's mortgaging our church buildings or finding new ways to put capital together. Uh, we, when we were trying to get into doing limited partnerships before the tax credit days, uh, we developed two uh, capital pools, and one was called Sharing and Solutions Through Investments. And we asked people to invest with us on a promissory note, and we would pay them back uh, if the deal, it was a risky thing, if the deals went through. And we had another one called Shelter for Shelter, or May We Have Your Interest. Uh, and that's where people invested with us at zero interest, and we d invested the money, got the interest, and used the interest for down payments uh, for people uh, in new houses. We've got to be smart. Today, one of the big new areas where there's going to be $2.5 billion worth of new investments in our low-income targeted community is the New Markets Tax Credit, something that a group of us spent the last four years working on, uh, and these uh, many companies now will be uh, making available these dollars into our communities. We've got to be smart. We've got to encourage the young people in our community that there is a vocation and a profession in community economic development, doing this with a difference. Third thing is that we can't do it by ourselves. We need partnerships. We need to, you know, the door is open now much more for working with government to the whole faith-based initiatives. Uh, and for us getting smart about how to do that uh, in kinds of ways, and you've got some people here at the conference and some workshops that are going to help us get even smarter uh, about doing that uh, in working in partnership with the government, not only nationally, but many states now have faith-based initiatives, uh, and many uh, cities do as well. Uh, but we also need to do partnerships in our own neighborhoods um, in terms of the other churches in our neighborhoods. That was great to hear the story about uh, KCCD um, and to see uh, what was happening here. QED it is. I'm sorry, I had the, the wrong uh, initials. Uh, but to see what was happening, churches working together, pooling their skills and their, their things. We need those kinds of partnerships we need to think about partnerships with corporations. Uh, Bethel's been really fortunate to have a partnership with Argonne National Laboratory, a technology laboratory. Their goal is technology transfer, and our goal was to help them figure out how to make their technology work in our community. And we were both partners in trying to figure that out and make it happen, and out of that comes some energy-efficient housing, uh, some location-efficient uh, mortgages, and a whole variety of other things. We need to partner with others and put our egos on the table. So one of the best ways to partner, if you're going to partner, is you've got to give away the credit. Okay? If you want a whole lot of people to work with you, you give away the credit. Because the mayor and the city government is always looking for their name and their praises. I'm sure the federal government it is as well, and, and you know the other churches. Uh, some of those churches get jealous of what you do. You give away the credit. You just thank God, number one, for what is happening in your midst, and then you give away the credit. And so then as we think about the, the fourth thing is, is that we need to build on what they know. Uh, and start with what they have. And we look at our neighborhoods, again, not as needy places, but as places where uh, people can discover, they can turn threats into opportunities, can, can discover uh, what the possibilities are. And let me just give you some of our examples. We realized that we had a lot of good natural caregivers in our community. People without high school diplomas, uh, but people who are already caring for grandmas and uncles and neighbors down the street. And we also realized we had a lot of elderly in our community, and that those were assets, those were strengths, not problems, and those were opportunities. And so we began um, an a, a, a enterprise to do in-home care services for elderly, where we could do a whole career ladder and people could be trained to do in-home care services. Elderly could be cared for in their community and in their homes, uh, and it developed that network. We now have over 225 people at Bethel working every day providing services for their neighbors uh, and those people down the street and getting paid for it, uh, a whole kind of building on assets. 
or um, you think about the skills and capacities then, or the physical assets of a community. Uh, in our community, we have an old uh, conservatory, a, um, and it was about to go to rot and ruin about 10 years ago. And when the heating plant went out, it's a, you know, a, green, a greenhouse kind of a thing, a conservatory. And it used to be internationally famous. And we held a press conference. We said, this is a crime and a shame to let this national treasure go to rot and ruin in our community. And um, if the heating plant had gone out, the plants were dying. And so we called attention, and then we had to go to every uh, park district board meeting for the next year uh, to say, you can't let this go to rot and ruin. And finally, after uh, some grants from uh, foundations and pulling together friends of the park and our aldermen and a variety of people, today the Garfield Park Conservatory, which in those days had only 3,000 people a year coming to it, in the last nine months, we had a Dale Jahuli glass construction exhibit and $8 million of rehab on the conservatory. And 500,000 people have come to visit the conservatory in nine months, whereas before it was 3,000 in a year. An asset of a community. And now we're a destination place. We've gotten a whole transit stop there. They overlook our brand new houses on the park. And it has changed people's perceptions of our community in a very important kind of way. Physical assets can become uh, an old closed down hospital campus that some of you who have visited us have seen that that's become an asset and an opportunity to pull together the kinds of people that are there. An opportunity when we had to struggle over the closing down of our transit line going through our community. And I know here in Los Angeles there's been some really mighty struggles around uh, public transportation, the Transit Riders Union and, and so forth. But we, uh, we had to pull together. We discovered that a transit stop is an asset is an opportunity. And so we're doing transit-oriented development, building a commercial center and a daycare center at a transit stop so mamas can pop off their kids and get on the L and go to work. And, and the businesses can thrive from the 3,000 people a day who get on and off at that stop. Thinking about those opportunities. And in Kansas City, the Black Economic Union uh, took its, as its opportunity, 18th and Vine. Now, how many of you know what 18th and Vine is? It's sort of the birthplace of the blues and the jazz uh, movement, right? 18th and Vine in Kansas City. They took a cultural, it was a decrepit street. It had gone to rot and ruin. And they have built around it the Jazz Museum and the Negro Baseball History Museum and all kinds of new housing and commercial development around a cultural asset. A memory of 18th and Vine. Just think of the opportunities we have. We have new eyes to see, and God gives us those new eyes to see the possibilities in people and the possibilities in our communities. So we have those new eyes. And finally, we need to go up the river. You and I can't be satisfied with our 50 units of housing and our, our new daycare center and all the rest of it because people are getting pushed into that river every single day. And yes, it's important to do our housing, and yes, it's important to do our job placements, but we've got to go up the river. We've got to become justice junkies, change agents, and figure out who and what is pushing people in that river. And there are whole lots of opportunities for us justice junkies to uh, begin to get moving. There are living wage campaigns in many cities saying that people need to have a living wage. It's not enough to work. Most poor people have to work two jobs and they still don't have a living wage. We've got to be about those living wage campaigns or working on the rearrangement of education funding so it isn't dependent on a property tax that is so savagely unequal that it'll never get straightened out unless we change how we fund public education. Or prisons in terms of alternative sentencing for those who have nonviolent offenses. Instead of sending them to prison uh, and ruining the rest of their lives, we need alternative sentencing so they're sentenced to rehabilitation and new opportunities for their lives. Um, there are, there's a National Low Income Housing Trust Fund initiative in Congress that has bipartisan support that would put in some, new, some badly needed new dollars 
uh, into our neighborhoods. In this issue of welfare reform, which Congress is going to have to readdress in the TANF authorization, um, the issue is let's, let's make that new bill help people get out of poverty rather than simply reducing our welfare roles. And the most important thing is that you and I have to help in our neighborhoods to make sure that people understand the importance of registering and voting. That our voices are heard, that we hold our elected officials accountable for getting these things done. And let me close with a story from South Africa uh, during the time of apartheid. And Bishop Tutu, I heard him tell the story. And it was an older man who was bruised and beaten and scarred and had been under house arrest and had spent years and years in jail. But he always had a smile on his face. And so somebody asked him, well, how can you? You've suffered so much. How can you keep on smiling? And he said, well, you know, I know when I get to those pearly gates that God's going to look at me and he's going to ask me one question. Where are your scars? Where are your scars? So you and I today as God's people in our neighborhoods and in our communities, as we think about just doing it, of starting to pour this oil, as the widow did under Elisha's, we need to know that we need to be willing to have those scars, that those are a blessing because we tried and we started pouring and we were willing to risk and we were willing to follow God's openings of little doors one time and one place at a time. And God makes a way out of no way. So as we think about this, let's think about what kind of scars are you willing to add to your crown so that you too can have a smile on your face. Thank you.